The life and ministry of the late Reverend William Branham has had a profound effect on multitudes of people around the world, and one of those people is my guest today, Reverend Sidney Jackson from Durban, South Africa. Now, uh, I believe, Brother Jackson, that you were an eyewitness to uh, many of the uh, miracles and things which took place during those meetings, and uh, you attended several of the services, the massive meetings which took place in that country. But just before we get to the actual interview and the account of those services, I would like to ask you a few questions about yourself so that the people would be a little bit acquainted with you. Yeah. Um, were you born in South Africa? Yes, I was born in 1900. 1900, so yeah. uh, it doesn't take too much mathematics <laughs> to calculate your uh, 77 then. Uh, that's easy. Yes, and um, uh, how many years have you been in the ministry? By God's grace, 25 years. 25 years. As a missionary. As a missionary. Yes. What countries uh, other than South Africa were you ministering well, in? first naturally was South Africa. From there I went up to Rhodesia, and then today what they call Zambia. Zambia. Yes. I've also been over in Mozambique, but uh, I've been over to the States, I think this is about the twelfth time. I've been over to Holland, Germany, and Britain, Venezuela, down South, South America. A good part of the world. Um, what other languages, I, I understand that you do speak uh, some of the native languages as well. Yes, I'm a naturally English descent, mm -hmm. but I speak English, Netherlands, Afrikaans, and I can speak the Shangan and Sutu, mm -hmm. mixed up also with Zulu. Mm -hmm. These languages I qualified in. Right. Um, what years was it uh, that uh, Brother Branham visited South Africa in which these large meetings took place? I, he, I know he was there uh, more than once, but the first time? Well, he actually, the first time he came was with campaigns. The second time he didn't come, he just passed through to Mozambique. Oh, yes. But he, I remember, well, I think it was the 4th of October, 1951, the first meetings were held in Johannesburg, which naturally is the biggest city in the Republic. Well, Johannesburg has a population of about uh, five million, does it not? Yes, something like that. And uh, then uh, the meetings were conducted actually in various of the larger centers. Yes, most of the big cities and towns They'd worked out an itinerary, and um, he would travel from one place to another. Yes. And I think the whole duration of the campaign was about nine weeks. Nine weeks of meetings. Yes, and he hardly had any rest. They just kept him going all the time. Well, that must have been a grueling yes, experience. Yes, it was terrific, yes. yes. Um, well, I want to uh, have you relate some of the things which you've seen, and I appreciate that uh, a lot of our viewers are not going to uh, have had the opportunity to see the things which you've seen, but I think it will be extremely interesting for them to be able to see and hear an eyewitness account of some of the things that took place in those meetings. I wonder if you could just relate uh, some of them, but first before we get to the actual uh, uh, things which took place, how uh, how large uh, were some of the services? Well, commencing in Johannesburg, which naturally was an enclosure, and it was the actual camping grounds of the Apostolic Faith Mission, who is the greatest Pentecostal group I in see. our country. That was the auditorium that they used? Yes, well, I wouldn't classify it as that. It was mainly under a shelter. Yes. Uh, if you allow me a moment, they purchased the uh, old Johannesburg Railway Station building, and it was just, well, I want to mention this because this is important, and it was just on this huge steel structure, and uh, it could accommodate anything up to 10,000. Yes. 
And then naturally the last three, three meetings had, the last night it was estimated up to 17,000. 17,000. Yes. yes, well that's where the gathering was. And then some of them in Durban were, were even much larger. Well, the Durban, we'll go to that, that was on the Greyvale racetrack. I see. But over in uh, Johannesburg, it was sponsored by a national committee made up of the various Pentecostal groups. I see. You actually uh, attended first the meetings in, yes, uh, in Johannesburg. Johannesburg, mm -hmm. yes. Uh -huh. Well, we stayed away about from where Johannesburg was about 300 miles. Mm -hmm. And when these advertisements had gone out about Brother Branham coming to South Africa, it was something so remarkable. As we read in the scriptures, we read there that the power of God was present to heal. Yes. And it might seem almost mysterious or unbelievable, but folk who'd never been even to the meeting and just heard about this little man, he was a statue, I would put him down about five foot, five, five foot, six, seven, about my height. Mm -hmm. And coming down to the meetings, God just seemed to electrify the whole country. Right. And even in the bus shelters and trains and traveling down in cars. And this is the truth and facts that children start screaming and start taking off their leg irons. While they were yes, in on bus shelters? Yes, en route, en route to the meetings. On their way to the services. Not even having attended a meeting before. My. It was just miraculous how God visited our country. And that seemed to, that seemed to blanket the entire city during well, those services. I could only put it down as a visitation from God. Yes. And God's compassion towards us. Yes, yes. You've related certain of the uh, instances which took place. You were speaking to me of one man uh, who I believe his doctor said he wouldn't even make it to the meeting. Uh, could you tell us a little bit well, about that? Well, Brother Ed, I will touch on that if you would just allow me a bit yet to get more or less what I have in mind and don't think the time will run out. But the night Brother Branham came onto the platform, the huge crowd was already there. And I want to mention around about four o'clock in the meeting, before the meetings, people were already accommodated there. What time was the meeting to start? Yes, well, is it 7.30? And at 4 o'clock, yes, we were already yes. gathering. Mm -hmm. And then he had meetings around about 4 o'clock, which Brother Baxter and them would preach. But he actually came on the platform at about 7.30. Yes. And these folk were there. And the night Brother Branham came onto the platform, hat in hand in his Bible, and as he stood there and just spoke, and he said, Good evening, friends. And then they had a healing line which was by way of card, mm -hmm. and then just anyone could call it random. Mm -hmm. We would have a healing line of about a hundred. But I don't think in any of the meetings the actual folk that came by card allocated to come onto the platform were about five or six. They would only deal with five or yes, six? Yes, you would about that. And then you see these two gifts given to him. The one was to discern the thoughts, the intents of the hearts of the people. Yes. And he would just tell you your name, where you came from. And if you were in an accident, he would tell you precisely how the accident was, your disease and everything. I mean, he was calling the people right out of the audience. Yes, yes. He would pray for the first five or six and then tell them their diseases and instances there where I saw a man walk upon the platform when he came walking up said your name is so and so and you came from Durban and he says your foot is so many inches short and the man came like that. He says turn around walk out God's healed you. My. And I happened to see that man's shoulders and as he came and he's walking when he walked straight with his shoulders back balanced and walked out. Instantly and miraculously Instantly healed. his foot lengthened. Well, those are instances where 
folk had come onto the platform. And I remember one man whom I knew well. He'd had cancer all over his body and on his head. And when the evening before he was in the meeting, when Brother Branham prayed that mass prayer, these cancers start falling and dropping off his head. But he still had a card. And as he come up, Brother Branham said to him, you've had cancer, you heal, just walk on. Is that right? Now, were, were the cancers types of growths? Yes, there were growths on his head, big scabs, they fell off. And he had a cancer here and they'd uh, endeavored to graft on, and it was unsuccessful. And another man, and you could see his ribs. And by the third, fourth day, it had healed up, and it was about the size of a match head on this man. He stayed about 30 miles from where I stayed This now. was a man you personally knew? Yes, this man. And they, he attended the first night, but the account of him having a ticket he still insisted to come up, I suppose there was that desire. And then Brother Brown said, you had cancer, we still come walking, you had cancer, you were healed last night, turn and go. <laughs> now, there were instances like that, but which was to me very, I mean, miraculous and absolutely so inspiring was when Brother Branham stood there speaking to the people and then he'd say, now, you realize there's a presence here. And then he would say, he says, now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take every man and every spirit under my control. And I've been in huge gatherings and even open airs where praying for the sick, you would even have dogs probably fighting out. This is in the colored areas. Mm -hmm. But when Brother Branham spoke that, you could hear almost well, anything drop in this huge gathering of people. Just thousands of people yes, quiet. thousands, 17,000 the third night. And he had absolute control. Now, that wasn't Brother Branham. No. Yes, sir. Just a hush over there. Yeah, just it took control. And I see him saying, you epileptic demon, come out of him and you hold your peace. My. He had full control. Mm -hmm. Well. It went on like this, and then these five, six folk would come along who had these cards, and the healing line would still stand there, and he would turn around, and he says, a little man right over there, and name his name, and tell him what disease, and even his address. Stand up, sir. God's healed you. Calling him out of the audience. Yes. And then I saw so many instances but folk that I know of, and one particular incident, this was a very well-known pastor. He had an operation, I think, on his gallbladder, and then went to his appendix, and um, he was brought to the meeting. The doctor, through a well-known other pastor that I know, would not let him come. But this brother pastor, he just begged him because this other pastor, he said, God will heal me if I can get to the meetings. The doctor eventually gave permission and he said, I'm granting him a dying wish. He said to him broadly, he said, if he ever reaches Branham meetings, I will say that Branham is of God. That was his dying wish to yes, know the doctor. Yes, he gave him, so I'm granting him a dying wish, he'll never reach there. And they brought this man along, and I was there in the ambulances. Well, there were numerous ambulances, double-decker buses. The whole country had just one mind and one thought, the Branham campaign. My. And the uh, hospitals had great trouble with their patients, mm -hmm. and the people became almost antagonistic and defiant, they wanted to get to the campaigns. And even, the even hospital... Even to get out of the hospital? Pardon? Even to get out of the hospital? Yes, and the ambulances had to run them in. You could see the pictures, the headlines in the pictures of all these various ambulances and double-decker buses standing there 
in this big camping grounds. Well, what happened then to this man? This well, pastor? this man, coming back to this man, the doctor said, I'm granting him his dying wish. And I was there when they carried him out of the, out of the ambulance. And as they carried him out, the pus ran on the ambulance floor. My. The two men carried him in, what you would say, a cot, we'd say a stretcher, and put him down there and went back to the ambulance. They said, we're coming back to pick you up just now. And this man, I know his name well, I don't want to mention any names. He was lying there, and Brother Branham praying for the sick here and pointing out someone that direction, turned round, pointed to him, said, your name is so-and-so. He says, you've had one. He says, I see two. You've had three operations. He says, sir, stand up, take up your bed and walk. My. And he stood up, right up. And he stood there after a while. He sat down on the cot. And it was about uh, half an hour afterwards, the ambulance folk came back to take him back to hospital. And they said, what's the matter? He says, I'm healed. <laughs> they said, well, get on the cot. We'll carry you back to the ambulance. He says, I'll walk back. And to their surprise, he walked back. And they said, well, they're going to take him back to hospital. He went back to hospital, but only to fetch his clothes. <laughs> yes, and this is a pastor, a yes, minister of the yes, gospel, yes. known to you. Yes. And, and you saw them carry him out. Well, he didn't carry him out. He walked out. That's what I mean. He, yeah. he, he walked out. They carried him in, and yeah. he walked out. Praise God. Now, up to just a few years back, that man was still living. That's only one out of, I would say, hundreds of cases. Well, they had a sick bay there, and there were just hundreds of wheelchairs and stretcher cases, as we would call them. These folk there, they had the uh, St. John's Ambulance and the Red Cross, all the nurses and various groups cooperated. It was wonderful even how the police assisted. Mm -hmm. And even in the Durban meeting, they had 74 police just parading there to keep the crowds. But in Johannesburg meetings, which the third night, you see, they'd worked out a night itinerary and then only had to stay three days in Johannesburg. And the third night, the crowds, well, accumulated to about 17,000. But Brother Ed, what I would like to relate here is in to around about towards five, six o'clock, the people all gathered there together. A terrific hailstorm set in. Before, and, before the service? Yes, before the service. And that's why I said this was just sheltered by galvanized roofing, a huge, I suppose it would be about 200 yards by about 150 yards wide, this big shelter. Mm -hmm. And the folk were sitting there, and they'd bulldozed this ground naturally level to erect this structure, been there for a number of years, and then the ground was sliding like this, and this terrific hailstorm, oh, it hailed for about an hour. All this water and hail rushed right into this big area where the meetings were held, and the folk were sitting high up like that on their feet, on their seats, mm -hmm. because it was nothing but hail and ice. And fortunately for those on cots, they, well, they were just lying a few inches above this hail. Nothing could be done. And when Brother Branham prayed that mass prayer, which, in my opinion, most of the meetings took place, and he would pray that mass prayer. When he prayed that mass prayer, it seemed that the power of God struck that audience. And I know that photos have been taken of it, and in the pictures which I had one, it seemed as if there was a, what we would say forked lightning moving over the crowd like that, just these rays of light. And as he prayed that mass prayer, my eye saw 20, 30 years in a wheelchair walking out, my. folk that we know. Praise God. One old woman was brought in and wheeled in, and the children came from out in the bush, 
and they weren't very much interested in her and they just left her there and went downtown. Well, when Brother Branham played that mass prayer, mass prayer, she walked out of the wheelchair and she was looking for her folk. And how long had she walking. been in the wheelchair? Now, in this case was 23 years. She had been in a wheelchair. Years. And the, the mass prayer, that was that prayed at the end of the service? Yes, when he had, what I would say, been praying more or less individually but he went right over as they were there and telling them what their names were being pointed out. I take it those folk who'd had that faith, you see. Yes. And as Brother Branham says, you operate that gift, not me. Just like with the Lord Jesus Christ, that woman went and touched the hem of his garment and virtue left him. And then this healing virtue would go out and Brother Branham would point to them, give them their names and addresses, their diseases, everything. And I saw quite a number of instances. One lady, she had a broken back in an automobile accident, and she said, address me, God's going to heal me. Is that and they had quite a problem to dress her. And she was lying there, and he told her everything precise, her name, what happened. He says, stand up. God has healed you. And she stood up. My mother was next to her, and the mother just fainted and fell right on the cot <laughs> where she was. And I had pictures taken of it and all. It was just too wonderful. All the papers was just alive with these meetings. And this was still in Johannesburg. In Johannesburg. Now I'd like yeah. to I'd like to go to uh, cover just a little bit of the meetings in Durban. Well, Did you also I, attend the services in Durban? Not I wasn't there, but I'm acquainted with everything. We went down to Durban that way. Yes. But what I wanted to mention here, when he prayed that mass prayer. Brother Ed, I saw people there, one particular instance, nine years bedridden. Nine years. And he said also, dress me, God's going to heal me. And he got off that cot and walked through that seven, eight inches of hail and ice. My. And wherever there were wheelchairs, people were just walking out, walking through this ice to the various cars and that. It must have been then that Brother Branham could detect that faith that was in the hearts of the people. Well, that was the gift which God gave him. Well, when he came the first night onto the platform, he said, folk, I have never seen such a measure of faith in any of my meetings. That's it. And it seemed just if there was an unction, and as I say, the power was present to heal because God met folk even, although they'd never even attended one of the services. Isn't that wonderful? And it continued in our country there for about eight weeks until eventually he went to the various places. But then the highlight of the meetings was at Durban. In Durban. At we the Gra Gravel Race Course. Yes, that was the uh, Gravel uh, that was, I Race think, Course. 25th of November, 1951. I was, um, I was in Durban and visited the racetrack yes, where these yes. meetings were conducted, and uh, we took some shots, yes. uh, some slides of, these, uh, of this track, uh, just so I could show the viewers the immensity yeah. of the, of the uh, uh, track there, yes. and also down, which we couldn't get in these slides, and we're going to show them to you in just a moment, what we couldn't get in the actual pictures was in the foreground of the racetrack is a large turf area, just yeah. green grass. And I understand from speaking to people in Durban that the entire open area, which goes right out into a golf course, it, that it was just covered with masses of yes. people. Yes, that's true. Now, the racetrack itself, it actually seats, does it not, 85,000? Is that about it? Well, they estimated the crowd on the seats, there was 60 to 80,000. 60 to 80,000 yes, in yes. the seats. Yes. And then uh, would there they have had been... They the area where the horses were racing. That was, uh, that yes. was some more people, would it yes, have been? Yes, it was just 
all over. As a matter of fact, the whole town was at a standstill. This whole city yes, just ground there was a, Well, I say town, but it was a city. And, um, well, there was no room even for a cycle. And there was no buses, nothing could move. They just took the whole town over. And about 20 miles from there at Clarewood, yeah. there were folk trying to come through. And I know of instances right 20 miles away, people were being healed where they stood there. That distance from the racetrack? Yes. All yeah. right, I want to show the people uh, a few shots of the Gravely racetrack now at this point so they can have an idea of the size of the track where the meetings were conducted. If uh, I would be allowed to just insert here, there was this one instance that they brought a maniac with a chain around his neck, an Indian, a young Indian, about, I would say, a teenager. Why did they have the uh, chain around his well, neck? Well, they had a chain around his neck. He was just tearing people to pieces. A maniac? Pieces. A maniac, and they had him chained. And they brought him in, and he was grabbing at everyone and just trying to tear the people. Something like, I suppose, that man at Kadara, you know, that the Lord went to deliver. Yes, yes. And when they brought him, they brought him up on the platform. Brother Branham said, bring him up on the platform. And everyone said, no, he'll do this. He says, bring your man up on the platform. When he come on the platform, they said, loose the man. They said, no, he said, stand him up on his feet and loose the man. God's delivered him. And they took the chain off, and he walking all with Brother Branham like that. In his sane delivered. mind, and then, you know, the Indians, I don't know if it's the Buddhas, I don't know which religion it is, but they have a black spot and a red spot to yes. denote their religion. I spat on their hands and rubbed this dot off without Brother Branham or anyone mentioning a word. Just confessing that they wanted well, to receive their, well, this what kind they, of Christ. They saw the power of God in right. action, yes. Right. Uh, just getting back to the uh, size of the meetings in Durban, uh, they turned away, I understand, upwards of 25,000 yes, people right at the gates. Yes. At that, uh, yes, was that he, in the first opening services? No, well, he was, he, you see, first added in, in the hall, and then he went over to the uh, racetrack. I see. And that's when the people, they just took the town by storm. And uh, there was no traffic at all, and uh, they had, well, it was just the seekers after thirsting, hungering after God, just coming along. They that took was the, because so, such an influx of yes, people uh, into the city, it just choked the city. Such an impact, yes, yes. Um, now, was it in Durban that after the service, uh, after the campaign had concluded, uh, Brother Branham was in his hotel, yes. and I believe he got a call from one of the yes. official Yes. officials of the city or something that asked him to come and look out his window and they were passing by with uh, truckloads of the stretchers and wheelchairs i've seen personally a photograph of that that's correct and yes. uh, uh, you you know about this well actually what happened brother it was that um, you see they wanted the racetrack again and this national committee had set out an itinerary and then they took him from there to Salisbury for a gathering about 1,500. And Brother Brannan said, well, you're taking us out of the will of God. He says, the revival's here. Mm -hmm. And they could have got the racetrack again, you see. Mm -hmm. But then they flew him to Salisbury, and that just was the end of the Durban meetings. How long were but they in Durban? No, they were there three days, first in halls, and this was the third day. Yes. Well, uh, Brother Branham was in a certain hotel, and I know the councillor very well. He'd been mayor quite a number of times. He'd been mayor of yes, Durban? Yes, of Durban. And, and now he was a councillor? Yes, municipal councillor. Mm -hmm. And um, this man, knowing him personally, and thanking God for about three years back, I had the privilege of baptizing him. Is that right? Yes. But uh, he phoned up and he said, Reverend Branham, look out of your window. 
And as I looked out, there were seven huge trucks, 10, 15 tonners, filled with wheelchairs, stretchers, and every aid that you could think of. My. They had to clear the racetrack, and they were taking this going down the town, and thousands upon thousands walking behind it, singing, all things are possible, only believe. They were looking for a dumping ground <laughs> to dump all these. Well, that is the truth. People went in the wheelchairs, and yes, went in the yes, stretchers, yes, went walk, in ambulances, out, and yes. walked out. Well, that was actually what happened. What took place. And that is the truth, yes. Yes, yes. Well, it's a marvelous account. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the viewers of uh, our interview today are going to be just vitally interested in these things, I'm sure that people are hearing things that they had never heard before. Uh, I'd like to cover just a couple of other points here. Uh, the newspaper coverage. I have seen some of the clippings of those meetings yeah. that were carried in the Durban newspaper. Uh, they gave quite good coverage to these services, did yes, they not? Yes, yes. I still have some of those cuttings at home. You have your own scrapbook, yes, I suppose, yes. of them. There's one particular instance. Over in Johannesburg, there were two uh, elders of a certain church. The dispute was in his house whether Brother Branham was a spiritualist or whether he was of God. Yes. And uh, it was quite a heated argument, and they were neighbors. And then the one walked out under the garden, which the two houses were linked together under the garden, the trees, the fruit trees en route to his house. It was round about after midnight because they'd been to the meetings. And as he went there, he says, a huge light confronted him. And he felt a hand touch on his shirt. His jacket was off. And he ran back, and he was trembling. He came back to his friend, and then he told him, he says, Brother Branham's of God. He says, look here, my shirt is the hot hand there. And there was an imprint of a whole hand on his shirt. And then he took that shirt off. The Fatherland newspaper, an Afrikaans paper, came and took photographs of that shirt and that hand. And it was told Brother Branham that this might seem mystic, told Brother Branham of this incident. He said, bring that shirt, and my hand will fit it precisely. Is that right? Now, and the newspaper took a the picture. The newspaper, it. it's recorded, the photograph, I had it, and Brother Petty Green in Tucson has that paper, the actual paper which I kept. Is that right? I turned it over to him. Very now these mysterious things were happening there, happening, and in one particular instance, Brother Branham was traveling along and he stopped the car and he said, gentlemen, you see that little hut up there in the hill? Will you take me to that hut? Uh, just a small building? Yes, a native hut. Yes. And uh, going up there, he said, this woman is a Christian. The woman that lives in the in hut? In the hut is a Christian and she suffers from TB, and she's lying on a cot and described everything. Is that right? And when he came in, she just praised God. Brother Branham prayed for her, and she raised up. She said she was praying to God, and God told her that he would send a man from the United States to pray for her and she got a healing. So God was speaking on both ends. That's spoke right. Spoke to yes. her, spoke to him. Yes, and, and sent the prophet there. Were, were they just uh, traveling to? Uh, they were traveling past. Traveling yes, past? Yes, they were on their way to East London when this happened. I see. And the uh, East uh, London Daily Dispatch recorded all those things. So all of these things are clearly documented? In the papers. In the newspapers? No dispute about yes. that. Nothing's here. Well, it's just a marvelous account, <laughs> just a marvelous account. 
Uh, there were at least two other accounts that I wanted to get in this interview before uh, we finish, and I thought they were remarkable uh, for two reasons. Uh, one was they were not in the masses of the people, and you were in attendance personally in both of them. And the other reason is, is it was in 1965, I believe, yeah. Uh, was it in the summer of 1965? It was June, July. June, July of 1965, yes. yes. And you were uh, going up into the uh, interior of uh, yes. Mozambique or Rhodesia, uh, which yes, was it? Yes, yes, that was Mozambique. In Mozambique. Up into the jungle areas. Yes, I, I was right with the prophet right up. Yes. Well, uh, perhaps you could just relate, uh, particularly the one of that uh, young boy and also the other man that was uh, delirious with some disease. Yes, it so happened that uh, we were camped that night there, and Billy Paul was with, and Billy him and... Billy Paul Bra is Brother yes, Branham's yes, son. Bra Brother Branham's son. And uh, they were, of course, accommodated in one tent, and I was in another. And Brother Branham came over, it was around about five o'clock, and he came over to my tent and he said to me, Brother Jackson, he says, now they're going to bring a man in here and he's suffering from smallpox. And he said, you know, the law of the land is that if any of these sick folk, folk would hail or stop you and tell you in their language, you see, that there is a man sick, then you, by law, are compelled to take him to the nearest doctor or hospital. I see, that That's is the law, law of the yes. land. Well, I was surprised that Brother Branham knew that. And I had an idea that these folk who had taken us along in uh, this automobile, which was a Land Rover, I thought that they told him something about it. I see. But because God had blessed him by knowing of these particular incidents and also revealing the thoughts, the intents, as I said, of the sicknesses. Now, here was an instance outside of a congregation. Yes. Absolutely in the wild country. Just in the jungles? Yeah, elephant, lion, everything. And he said to me, now, Brother Jackson, this man suffers from smallpox. He said, if you were called to pray for him, would you lay hands on him? He said, you know, immediately you lay hands on you or a contact, and then you would be isolated. Because it's a contagious yes, disease. Yes, contagious disease. I said, yes, appreciate that. He said, would you lay hands on him? Mm -hmm. What would you do, Brother Jackson? And just in my humorous manner and way, I said, well, I would do what the Irishman said. He said, well, what did he say? I said, the Irishman said, shoot first and argue afterwards. <laughs> and he just said, come. He said, now you realize they're going to take that man, he's going to take our vehicle, and we will be sitting here for a day or two without a vehicle because they'll have to take him to the hospital about 150 miles away. Right. Out of the jungles. Yes, yes. The hospital, nearest hospital, was at Byra and 150 miles away. So he said, Come. I didn't understand it. I thought that these folk who provided this vehicle told him all about it, not really realizing that it was God speaking to him. He said, Come, and we pushed our way through the grass. Now, it wasn't even what we would say a game track. It was no track at all. He just pushed through this grass six to eight feet high. We call it elephant grass. He said, come, and I followed him. Usually in the bush, I would go in front. Yes, because he wasn't familiar yes, with Yes, but he just walked on like that. I would say about 200 yards from the camp, he just came and he said, stand still, Brother Jackson. And that was so remarkable to me. And we stood still, and I heard a rustling coming along through the grass. And here they carried a man in on a stretcher made out of just strips of bark. 
and they carried him. And when they brought him in, he was groaning, oh, oh. and Brother Branham said, Brother Jackson, tell them to put him down. And I spoke in their language. I said, Fagai in a Hansi, put him down. And he said, lay your hands on him, Brother Jackson. I just put my hands on, and he put his hands on, and this terrific temperature that he had, and the smell of the man hit me right in my face. And they easy be there about 90, could be 100 degrees in the shade. It's tropical. And he said, put him down, put him down, laid hands on him. He said, come, Brother Jackson. And I followed him. And he found his way back to the camp, and I following him. Leaving the men right there? Yes, leaving the man there. And sat there a while, and here they come through, pushing through the grass, carrying this man and went over to the driver, and then this European, it was a Portuguese man, spoke to him, and they loaded him on the truck. On your truck? Yes, which is our truck that we were supposed to use, and then set off. And then I gathered from them that he was now being taken to hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't see him, and I had our supper and that, and I retired, went to bed. Next morning early, I woke up. I saw, here's our truck standing here. So I went over to the driver, which is a native. I said, you got back soon? He says, no, I didn't go. I said, what was the matter? He said, well, this man, just a mile or two out of camp, he thumped on the back of the truck. I looked through the wind. He said, put me down here. My house is here. He lived nearby? Yes. And he was? Where is he? He said, I said, was he sick? He said, no, he was as right as rain. <laughs> and then about a week after that, we were at Byra. And then one of the natives came up to me and said that one of these young men wanted to see the master. And I went and there was this young boy that had this smallpox. And he'd walked away about 150 miles to come and say thank you. He had walked? With gratitude, yes. Probably got a lift, I doubt it. Just to come to, to come and say meet. thank you. And that was about a week afterwards to see the master who prayed for him and say thank you. It must have been that God saw that heart in the first place. <laughs> well, the love and compassion of God, That's Brother right. Ed, That's we right. is past finding Can't out. Can't understand yes. it, no. Just one more, yes. and that was uh, that young boy, while you were driving yes. through the jungles yes. and passing a small native village. A little village. native village, yes. And uh, you saw that, you, you were explaining to me that the children, as you drive past uh, these little native villages, that the children come because they don't see vehicles very They're often. They're a bit scared, and they just run back to the huts, you see. Yes. They're dead scared of an automobile. It's absolute wild country. And they just wear their rod. Uh, it's just a little skin. Just a little loincloth, yes. is it? Uh, well, mostly little skin. Uh -huh. And they were playing there, and they saw us, and they just fled towards the huts. Just a little village. And as we passed, Brother Branham said to the driver, just stop a moment. And he said, Brother Jackson, he pointed over to a group, about 20, 30 little, these small natives. and. Um, he said, uh, Brother Jackson, you see that little boy over there? I would put him down to about, say, six, six years, years or old. something like that. He says, you see, he's wearing a little charm around his neck. I said, yes. He said, call him here and call his father here. Well, I really doubted whether his father would be there because I know these Portuguese folk on account of them staying on this, although it's absolute wild territory and country, excuse me, they have to, you see, work in the mines and that. The fathers go. The fathers, yes, and then they come home at different periods in the year. So when I called him and I called, I said, is his father here? His father came. Now that on its own was a surprise to me. And Brother Branham got off the truck, and he said, Brother Jackson, tell him he's wearing that little charm, which is a little nut. 
It's a hard nut. It's called a marulu nut. And he said, tell his father that he suffers from TB. Mm. Now, to explain that, you couldn't tell him TB. He wouldn't know anything. So you have to imitate. So I said, <laughs> he says, yes. Mm -hmm. He says, and you tell him he's had that right from birth. Yes. Right. Now you tell him that he's wearing that a little, what I would say, token, because he believes in the, his forefathers. And that little token will protect him by the forefathers' spirits. Now, in the scripture, we know that they pray there and they said, the God of our father, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, and even in amongst these tribes, just to add in here, they believe all those things. They have no Bible. They even circumcise, mm. and they even use stone for circumcision. And there are many, many things there that they just adhere to, and it's a word of God working from generation to generation. Now, when I told the father that, he said, it's correct. Brother Branham said now to these other folk, this man who had had the Land Rover, he said, gentlemen, will you remove your hats, please? We took our hats off. He said, Brother Jackson, lay hands on him. I laid hands on him, and he laid hands, and he prayed. He said, now, Brother Jackson, you tell his father he'll never have that disease again. God's healed him. Wonderful. And the boy really was receptive, and you could see he just believed and he accepted it. Now, of course, to me, which was so miraculous, was and mystic, if we want to use the word, is that there was there 20, 30 of those little natives, and that God would single one out. Yes. Now, it is very, very difficult to believe that, but we know that even the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, walked up to that pool of Bethesda. That's right. And when all those folk were laying there, cripples and every disease, he only healed one. Yes. Well, Brother Ed, that... I mean, it's been experiences I've had with Brother Branham, and I'm really grateful to God. And these things are absolutely the truth. Yes, well, all I can say is that we are just uh, delighted to have had this account, and uh, I know that it's going to be just uh, uh, a lasting blessing to a lot of people. Um, I'm sure that between the years of 1951 to 1965, there were many things that took place. I know that you were also in America and attended meetings. And uh, I know that your life has been profoundly affected by the not only the miraculous, but also the, the ministry of the Word, which uh, we believe that God used this man Brother Branham, to restore the Word of God back Amen. to the church. And I know that you believe that. Um, I do. And having been blessed myself by your ministry, I know in turn that you've been blessed by his ministry. God. And so this is the thing that we are desiring to convey. And I believe that uh, today's interview is going to just strengthen that uh, to let you know that God has done something of a very miraculous nature in our day and in our generation. And I want to thank you, Brother Jackson, for coming and visiting us at this time. God bless, God bless you, bless Brother. You. Thank you.